With meningitis, meninge refers to the meninges, which are three protective membranes that cover the brain and spinal cord. And itis refers to inflammation, so meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges. More specifically, it refers to inflammation of the two inner layers, which are called the leptomeninges. The outer layer of the meninges is the dura mater, the middle layer is the arachnoid mater, and the inner layer is the pia mater. These last two, the arachnoid and pia maters, are the leptomeninges. Between the leptomeninges, there's the subarachnoid space, which houses cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. CSF is a clear, watery liquid which is pumped around the spinal cord and brain, cushioning them for impact and bathing them in nutrients. In one microliter or cubic millimeter, there are normally just a few white blood cells, up to five. If we look at a bigger sample, like say a deciliter, then around 70% of those will be lymphocytes, 30% will be monocytes, and just a few will be polymorphonuclear cells, or PMNs, like neutrophils. That same volume will have some proteins in it as well, about 15 to 50 milligrams, as well as some glucose, about 45 to 100 milligrams, which is close to two-thirds of the glucose we'd find in the same volume of blood. The cerebrospinal fluid is held under just a little bit of pressure, below 200 millimeters of water, which is just under 15 millimeters of mercury, which is less than a fifth of the mean arterial pressure. Now, at any given time, there's about 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid in the body, and this is constantly replenished, with around 500 milliliters of new cerebrospinal fluid produced every day, and the excess, or 500 minus 150 or 350, is absorbed into the blood. But for any nutrients to enter or leave the cerebrospinal fluid, and the brain itself for that matter, they have to go through the tightly regulated blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a special name given to the blood vessels in the brain. That's because the endothelial cells in the blood vessels are so tightly bound to one another that they prevent leakage and only allow certain molecules to slip through them. Meningitis is the inflammation of the leptomeninges which remember are the inner two membranes around the brain and spinal cord. It is not the inflammation of the brain itself, that's encephalitis, but sometimes they can happen together and when that happens it's called meningoencephalitis. So meningitis needs some kind of trigger for the inflammation, and this could be an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself, like lupus, or the body having an adverse reaction to some medication which can happen with intrathecal therapy, when medication is injected directly into the cerebrospinal fluid. But by far, infection is the most common trigger for meningitis across all age groups, like with the Neisseria meningitidis bacteria or herpes simplex virus. Now, there are two routes that an infection can take to reach the cerebrospinal fluid and leptomeninges. The first way is direct spread, which is when a pathogen gets inside the skull or spinal column and then penetrates the meninges, eventually ending up in the cerebrospinal fluid. Sometimes the pathogen will have come through the overlying skin or up through the nose, but it's more likely that there's an anatomical defect to blame. For example, it could be a congenital defect, like spina bifida, or an acquired one like a skull fracture, where there might be cerebrospinal fluid leaking through the sinuses. The second way is hematogenous spread which is when a pathogen enters the bloodstream and moves through the endothelial cells in the blood vessels that make up the blood-brain barrier and get into the cerebrospinal fluid. To do this, the pathogens typically have to bind to surface receptors on the endothelial cells in order to get across. Otherwise, they have to find areas of damage or more vulnerable spots like the choroid plexus. Once the pathogen finds a way into the cerebrospinal fluid, it can start multiplying. Soon enough, the handful of white blood cells surveilling the cerebrospinal fluid identify the pathogen and release cytokines to recruit additional immune cells. Over time, a microliter of cerebrospinal fluid might go on to contain thousands of white blood cells, but any more than five usually defines meningitis. In most bacterial cases, there'll be above 100 white blood cells per microliter, and more than 90% polymorphonuclear cells. In most viral cases, there'll be 10 to 1,000 white blood cells. 
and over 50% lymphocytes in under 20% PMNs. In most fungal cases, there'll be 10 to 500 white blood cells, with over 50% being lymphocytes. In most cases of tuberculosis meningitis, there'll be 50 to 500 white blood cells, with over 80% being lymphocytes. The additional immune cells attract more fluid to the area and start causing local destruction as they try to control the infection. As a result, the cerebrospinal fluid pressure typically rises above 200 millimeters of water. The immune reaction also causes the glucose concentration in the cerebrospinal fluid to fall, to below two-thirds of the concentration in the blood. It also makes the protein levels increase to over 50 milligrams per deciliter. When it comes to the causes of meningitis, viruses and bacteria usually cause acute meningitis, whereas fungi usually causes chronic meningitis. Now, for bacteria, there are a lot of possibilities. In newborns, the most common causes are group B streptococci, E. coli, and listeria monocytogenes. In children and teens, the most common causes are Neisseria meningitidis and Streptococcus pneumoniae. In adults and the elderly, the most common causes are Streptococcus pneumoniae and Listeria monocytogenes. There are also tick-borne causes of meningitis, like Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria, which is the cause of Lyme disease. As for viruses, the main culprits are enteroviruses, especially Coxsackie virus, as well as herpes simplex virus. HIV is usually contracted through body fluids and can also cause viral meningitis. Less common causes include the mumps virus, varicella zoster virus, and lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. There's also the fungi, like those from the Cryptococcus and Coccidioides genuses, which mainly affect immunocompromised individuals. And then of course there's tubercular meningitis, which is caused by the Mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria. And finally, parasitic causes of meningitis like P. falciparum, which is the main cause of malaria. Now, the classic triad of meningitis symptoms are headaches, fevers, and nuchal rigidity, or neck stiffness. It can also cause photophobia, which is discomfort with bright lights, or phonophobia, which is discomfort with loud noises. Meningoencephalitis can cause an altered mental state or seizures. The diagnosis of meningitis starts with a physical exam. One maneuver is when a person lies flat on their back facing upwards, and one of their legs is raised with the knee flexed to a 90 degree angle. Then the leg is supported and slowly straightened at the knee. If this causes back pain, then it's called Koenig's sign. Another maneuver is when a person again lies flat on their back facing upwards, and then has their neck supported and flexed. If this causes them to automatically flex their knees or hips, then it's called the Brzezinski sign. If meningitis is suspected, a lumbar puncture can be done. And this is when a needle goes through the lower lumbar vertebral levels of the spinal cord, between L3 and L4, for example. The needle penetrates into the subarachnoid space and a few milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid is taken. The opening pressure can be measured, and the cerebrospinal fluid can be analyzed for white blood cells, protein, and glucose. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, might also be used to find specific causes, like HIV, enteroviruses, HSV, or tuberculosis. If a particular infection seems like an obvious cause, then a test for that might be used, like the western blot for Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria, or a thin blood smear for malaria. The treatment of meningitis depends on the underlying cause. For bacterial meningitis, it's common to administer steroids and then antibiotics to prevent massive injury to the leptomeninges from the inflammation caused as the antibiotics destroy the bacteria. In general, drug treatments like antivirals, antibacterials, antifungals, or antiparasitics are aimed at the specific cause of meningitis. Prevention with a vaccine is appropriate for some causes like Neisseria meningitidis but also for mumps and for disseminated tuberculosis. Prophylactic antibiotics can also be administered to avoid outbreaks of bacterial meningitis, like in households where individuals haven't been vaccinated against Neisseria meningitidis. All right, as a quick recap, meningitis is an inflammation of the leptomeninges, which is the inner two membranes that surround and protect both the brain and the spinal cord. 
It normally starts when a foreign substance, oftentimes bacteria, makes its way inside the leptomeninges, either by direct contact or hematogenous spread through the blood-brain barrier. The immune system responds to the antigen by flooding the subarachnoid space with white blood cells, which release cytokines and create inflammation. And this results in the classic triad of symptoms, which is headaches, fevers, and neck stiffness, 